All right, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Okay. <laughs> we all feel the same way. Although tomorrow is another work day. Okay, so I have a couple things at the top. So yesterday, a North Dakota judge struck down the state's near total abortion ban. The law makes it a felony for doctors and other health care providers to provide women the care that they need. It is extreme, dangerous, and terrifying, and has left North Dakota without any abortion providers. And that was made possible when the former president handpicked three, three Supreme Court justices to overturn Roe v. Wade. As a result, more than 20 states have abortion bans currently in effect. And it's not stopping at the state level. Republican elected officials in Congress have proposed four national abortion bans while refusing to protect nationwide access to IVF and contraception. President Biden and Vice President Harris believe that women in every state must have the right to make deeply personal decisions about their health. They continue to call on Congress to restore the protections of Roe v. Wade into federal law and fight efforts by Republican elected officials to undermine our fundamental freedoms. Next, I, wanna, I wanted to uh, also quickly recognize all of the amazing Team USA athletes who participated in this year's Paralympics in Paris that, that ended this past weekend. Team USA showed incredible resilience and strength. This year's athletes brought home an impressive 105, including 36 gold medals. From the president on down, we have all been cheering you on here at the White House. We are so proud of all of you. As a president, uh, as the first lady said, pardon me, and I quote, our athletes carry more than just our flag. They carry our nation's heart and our hopes with them too. And finally, as you all know, the president joined a, a brunch in celebration of black excellence on the South Lawn this afternoon. Over the coming days, President Biden will participate in a celebratory engagement centered on the triumphs and legacy of black Americans and the institutions they have created. In addition to today's brunch and celebration of black excellence, President, uh, President Biden will deliver remarks at the 2024 Phoenix Awards dinner on Saturday and address the National HBCU Week Conference in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on Monday. These events will focus on speaking directly to the community about the Biden-Harris administration's accomplishment for the black community. As, as a proud black American myself, uh, I, I must say that I am incredibly uh, proud to be working for a president and a vice president who, have who has certainly delivered for black Americans. His, t his time in office is marked by significant wins for the black community, including achieving the lowest black unemployment rate on record, nominating Justice Kantaji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court and investing a historic $16 billion uh, into HBCUs. We are looking forward to traveling to Philadelphia this coming Monday. And with that, Darlene. Hi, thank you. Hello. Uh, two questions. So the administration had promised to use the full extent of the law to make sure that pregnant patients got emergency care after Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, we, the AP is reporting today that none of the hospitals that have denied care to pregnant patients since Roe v. Wade was overturned have been fined. Okay. Do you know why? So I would have to talk to the Department of Justice. I don't have, I'm just now learning uh, this reporting that the Associated Press has. Uh, so I would have to go back to the Department of Justice and also refer you to them as well uh, to get a, a better sense of how they're operating that particular uh, that particular policy. Uh, but I would have to say, and I said this at the top, but we would not be in this position if the former president did not appoint three three Supreme Court justices with, uh, with one of the, uh, obviously, one of the goals that they were successful at was making sure the Dobbs decision was done, which overturned Roe v. Wade, which was uh, a constitutional right that women had uh, for nearly 50 years. And that is why the president had to step in that is why the president had to uh, sign an executive order. That is why we have been very forceful, very clear uh, about what Dobbs' decision has done. And we don't even have to, it doesn't have to come from us. We could see what has happened across uh, the states, 21, 22 states that now have 
uh, abortion bans, and now that is affecting, as we know, 27 million women uh, at, who are now affected by this, uh, who, um, who their reproductive freedom um, has been taken away. Uh, those, that decision to make those really personal decisions for themselves has been taken away. Uh, but as it relates to that specific question, I would have to refer you to Department of Justice. And since the, um, the president mentioned Springfield, Ohio, in his remarks, he didn't, he didn't actually say Springfield, but we knew what he was talking about, is the administration considering any help for Springfield? They have been facing bomb threats. Some schools were evacuated today. Is there any? So, look, um, as it relates to that, certainly we are aware of the evacuations. Uh, local police are investigating what is happening on the ground, the situation. We encourage everyone to please, uh, please follow the, the advice and the direction of the public safety, follow their guidance. Uh, I'm going to be mindful, not uh, speculate on the evacuations, uh, but I, again, to, to your point of what the president said uh, and what we have said from here, from this podium, it is that uh, it is extremely sad and concerning uh, that a community is facing this type of danger and vitriol. Uh, and as the president said today, I think very forcefully, uh, this needs to stop. Um, and um, there is absolutely no place, absolutely no place uh, in this country, in our, certainly in our political discourse, for this type of uh, vitriolic, uh, smearing, hateful language. Uh, and certainly, as we have done in the past three and a half years, and the president has done throughout his career, and the vice president as well, we're going to continue to call that out and condemn uh, that type of uh, vitriolic behavior. Uh, we will certainly um, uh, offer any assistance, uh, if needed, uh, on the ground by the local, the local police. Thank you. Okay. And just to bounce off the question about Springfield, the Ohio governor said that the federal government needs to give Springfield some help to deal with the influx of migrants. What's the president's reaction to that, and does the White House have plans to provide some funding to the state? So a couple of things, and I'm glad I'm actually glad you asked this question because there are a couple of things I do want to lay out that the administration has been able to do. Uh, again, this is conspiracy theory. What we're hearing uh, that has been debunked uh, by the Ohio uh, the, the, uh, the Ohio Police Department, uh, the Springfield Mayor, uh, the City Manager, uh, and so we have to make sure that we put that out there, that this has been debunked, uh, and spreading this type of hate, hateful uh, conspiracy theories is indeed very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Um, so since day one, our priority has been ensuring communities across the country have uh, the support they need. So we've delivered resources to Ohio as well to cities, states, and non-for-profits uh, across the country. Since the spring, DHS has been directly engaged with the city of Springfield and local officials to make sure they have uh, the support they need. Uh, and we want to do more. We would like to do more. That's why we did the bipartisan uh, proposal uh, with the Senate early um, at the end of last year, obviously early into this year, and it was stopped. It was stopped because the former president said that bill, that particular proposal, would hurt him and help Joe Biden. And so Republicans in Congress stopped that. It would have given more. I uh, would have given more resources uh, to cities like Springfield, Ohio, uh, but I don't want it to uh, to miss the point here that the administration has indeed provided more than $1.3 billion in grant funding to in, jurisdiction, in jurisdiction around around the country to help uh, to help with, with the influx and what they're dealing with. We want to do more, but we've been blocked in doing so. So are there any new conversations that the president is trying to start right now for we'll, further assistance? We want to fix this problem. We want. We did $1.3 billion. That's something that this administration has been able to do. We want more funding. Republicans are getting in the way in Congress. We were able to put forward, a, again, a bipartisan deal that would have been the toughest and the fairest uh, law if the president had an opportunity to sign it. Republicans got in the way. Now, if Republicans want to work with us in a good faith, they did. They actually did. And then they turned their backs on what they wanted, on what they thought they believe would be the right way to move forward in dealing with the immigration system and dealing with the border uh, challenges. And they walked away from it. And I, we need them to come to the table again. We need them to actually want to move forward to deal with this issue. And just shifting gears to Boeing, 30,000 workers are on strike for the first time in 16 years at Boeing. And Boeing CFO said this is going to impact production, deliveries, operations, and will jeopardize 
their recovery. So how is the president reacting to this and what's his message to those workers? So uh, we're administration of officials are indeed in touch with uh, Boeing and the machinist. Uh, so we encourage them to negotiate in good faith, which is something that we say uh, when when situations get to the, this level. Uh, and we believe that uh, they need to negotiate, yes, in good faith and work towards an agreement that gives employees benefits uh, and that they deserve. Uh, uh, you know that, and it would make the country and it would make the company stronger as well. Uh, so we're in touch with the parties and again continue to to encourage them uh, to negotiate in good faith. Thank you, Karine. Um, first, two points of clarification on Springfield. Yeah. Conspiracy theories aside, the governor says that this influx of migrants has caused a significant strain on the health care and public safety system in Springfield. Does the administration acknowledge that? Or, we or have well, talked to them about it? I, I, look, we, and I said this in my answer prior, we've been in touch with, uh, with Springfield from uh, since the spring. We've been in touch with them. DHS has, and we've been offering assistance to them, uh, and and that is something that we've taken very seriously. Uh, and we have been able, uh, during in 2023, this administration, we've been collaborating with states and cities across the country, and we launched this one-stop uh, clinic, uh, one-stop shop clinics, uh, to to help eligible non-citizens uh, get work permits and, uh, and decompress their res respective shelter systems. And today, those clinics uh, have served more than 37,000 people. So that shows uh, how we've been working with um, different jurisdictions across the country. And we've provided, I just mentioned, more than $1.3 billion to address the concerns that, uh, for example, that the governor has, uh, uh, mayors have, and obviously in, in cities and towns. And so we've done that. We'll, we want to continue to help. But we also need Congress to get involved. And that's why the president took very seriously the negotiations that were happening to try to get the toughest, fairest uh, border uh, border deal. And we were able to do that. Republicans got in the way. But $1.3 billion to help uh, cities across uh, cities and states across the country is nothing to, to sneeze at. So short of a deal, are you saying that currently there is no more federal resources to give we need, to Springfield. We need more federal resources. Okay. We have been working with Springfield, uh, Ohio in particular, since the spring. Since the spring. We need more funding. We need more. And that is why the president and his team got together with Republicans and Democrats in the Senate to come up with this border deal. Donald Trump, the former president, told Republicans in Congress to not move forward with it they voted against their own bipartisan deal. And then turning to tariffs, during the debate, the vice president described Trump's proposed tariffs as a sales tax on middle class families. Today, the Biden administration announced new tariffs on about $18 billion worth of Chinese goods that will go into effect in two weeks. So can you talk about whether these new tariffs are fundamentally different from what Trump has proposed and how? So the 301 tariff, the, the tariffs. So look, we made an announcement uh, this morning, as you just, uh, that went out early this morning. And I think uh, the president, when he, back in May, uh, when he was announcing that he was going to take action, uh, he said very clearly he was going to do that to protect Americans, uh, workers, and businesses from China's unfair trade uh, practices. And that's something, a commitment that he made and he spoke to back in, in May. and. The comparison, as you're asking me, uh, the Trump administration, the last administration, uh, their trade deal with China failed to increase, uh, boost American manufacturing. Uh, and what the president's economic agenda, what we've been trying to do for almost four years now, and we've seen some results here, uh, is nearly $1 trillion of new investments here in America. Manufacturing investment has hit record highs, and factory construction has doubled to a record high. The annual trade deficit with China is the lowest in a decade, and that is because of the president's economic agenda, lower than any year under the last administration. And so the president is going to take, continue to take action to protect American uh, workers uh, and manufacturing and um, encourage China to eliminate its unfair uh, practices. As it goes to the specifics of it, obviously USTR will have more uh, information on that. Uh, but the president made a commitment. 
He's keeping to his commitment. And if you can see what his economic agenda has actually done, manufacturing businesses, uh, and how that um, how that lines up uh, with China and what China what it, what China has uh, how his how his agenda has affected uh, uh, China's um, behavior, uh, and I think that matters. I'm sorry, I should have been more clear. Yeah. How is it not a sales tax on all the goods that people buy every day? Look, what we're trying to do is making sure that we're protecting American workers and businesses. That's what we're doing. USTR can certainly get into more details and specifics uh, to your question, but our you know, our commitment, and I think it shows in the president's economic uh, policy, as I just laid out, and what, how, uh, how the annual trade deficit with China is the lowest, is the lowest in a decade, lower than any year during the last administration. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is eliminate China's unfair practices, and we've seen the results of that. That was the commitment that this president made in May, and that's the commitment that will continue. And this is about American workers and businesses, and we're going to certainly continue to deal with China's unfair trade practices, and that's Thank what you're you. seeing. Uh, okay. Ms. Green, um, just back to the Boeing strike, does the White House believe that there is an immediate economic impact from the strike? So uh, we're in touch with um, uh, with officials, and this is something uh, that, as I said, all, as I say all the time when I get asked this question, we're going to monitor very, very closely. Uh, I don't have a specific question to you on that, on, on a yes or no, but this is something that we're certainly going to monitor. Uh, what we want to see uh, is uh, all parties to come together in good faith and come up with a deal that helps uh, the workers, the hard work, right, uh, continues to really respect the hard work that the workers uh, uh, do day in and day out uh, for companies, but I, but I don't have any anything specific we're going to monitor, we're going to keep eye on it. Not even a general assessment on the economic impact, immediate or otherwise? This is something that we're going to monitor. Okay, and just staying on that topic, I'm stepping back a little mm -hmm. bit. You've obviously gotten a number of Boeing-related questions in this job, the door that blew off the plane, number of compliance issues. There are two astronauts who are literally stuck in space. What do you think is going on with the company? I can't speak for what's going on inside of a, a, a company. That is for them to, to certainly speak to. Uh, as it relates to the strike that is currently happening, uh, we're certainly in touch with Boeing and the machinists. Uh, we want them to come together in good faith. Uh, as it relates to uh, the safety concerns that Americans should have, rightly have, uh, obviously the Department of Transportation has been on top of that, dealing with, uh, dealing, uh, uh, with uh, ways to to uh, make sure there's transparency and they deal with those safety issues. FAA has been on top of that as well. Uh, but I can't speak to what's going, in, going on uh, with Boeing. Uh, that is something for them to speak to. Just one more on sure. a separate topic. Um, Pope Francis today said about the upcoming presidential election that voters here have to choose the lesser of two evils. He pointed to Donald Trump's anti-immigrant positions and then the vice president's support of abortion rights. Do you know if the president is aware of these comments, if he has had any reaction? I mean, obviously, the pope speaks for himself. Uh, and uh, I don't have any, any more comments from here. I have not spoken to the president about uh, the post specific comments on the uh, this coming election. Okay. Just to follow up on Boeing. Sure. Um, so, so we understand that admin officials, including Julie Su, are in touch with uh, both sides. Yeah. Uh, but is there some, someone specific, um, like a liaison, like James Sperling was in the UAW talks that the White House has appointed? So I, I don't have a specific person to point to from the White House. White House officials, including the Department of Labor, as you just mentioned, the Secretary, the Acting Secretary, has been in touch uh, with Boeing and the Machinist on this particular matter, uh, but don't have a, poison, a person to point out to you. But White House officials here uh, have, uh, have been in touch. And, and are the President or the Vice President planning to join any of these workers on the picket line? Have any discussions taken place? As you know, the President uh, was the first President to, uh, to go to uh, Michigan and be with UAW workers when they were striking, and he was very proud to do that, has been named the, the most pro uh, pro uh, union uh, president uh, ever, and so he's proud to uh, to to hold that uh, title. I don't have um, or acknowledgement 
Uh, I just don't have anything to share on either of their schedules. Has the president spoken to the union? I don't have a, a, a call to speak to at this time. Oh, and, and one quick one on the U.S. Steel, Nippon Steel uh, deal. The Washington Post was reporting that the White House may push a decision on the deal until mm -hmm. after the election. We did say we did see some pushback from the White House saying that there was no timeline around this. But is there any other? Is there any clarity you can offer on what the reporting was? So we've been very clear. The president has been very clear. He wants to make sure uh, that, and it is vital that U.S. Steel uh, is to remain an American steel company, and that is uh, domestically owned and obviously operated. The president uh, told uh, our steel workers as he has their backs. And he meant that. You remember when he was on Labor Day, he was uh, in Pennsylvania and said that. The vice president said that as well, uh, or made that very clear in her remarks as well. And um, and so we have not received any recommendations from CFIUS. There's a process. Uh, CFIUS has to make a recommendation. It has to be transmitted to the president. The president then makes a decision that has not occurred, that has not happened. CFIUS is independent, uh, and they're going to make those decisions. Um, I believe last week the White House provided uh, a statement that we have not received any recommendations, so that continues to be the case, um, and so don't have any anything. And I, and I, uh, and uh, so I just don't have anything to share if this is eminent uh, on uh, on a decision. They are, they are independent. Is, would the White House recommend that Sophia's expedite the review process? I it's mean, their process. Been, has been looking at the deal for a while. For some time, I know. Yeah. And it's, it's their process. They are independent. And the process is they make the decision, their recommendation, it's transmitted to us, and the president obviously makes a decision. Uh, but that has not occurred, and they ha we have to allow them to have the space to make that decision, so, so to, to, to the process to play through. So, so you're saying the Post saying that the, the decision, it, it could land only after the election. Is that I, accurate I, or not? Uh, what I'm saying to you, how the process works, we have not received any recommendations yet uh, from CFIUS, uh, therefore, it could not be an imminent if we have not received any recommendations. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Hey, it's great. Hey. Uh, former President Trump this afternoon said if elected, he would do, quote, large deportations from Springfield, Field, Ohio, and would send them to Venezuela. These Haitian migrants are in Ohio legally and, of course, aren't from Venezuela. Does the White House have a reaction to this pledge of the former president? Um, uh, obviously, he was speaking as a candidate, uh, and that is the upcoming elections. Uh, but I will say more broadly, if Republicans were serious about fixing what is happening at the border, the border challenges, which majority of Americans care about, if they were serious about it and they truly cared about this issue, they truly cared about fixing an immigration system that has been broken for decades, they would get back to the table or they don't even have to. There's a deal. There is a border deal, a bipartisan border deal. They can vote on it, and we would have the toughest, fairest um, uh, deal that we've seen in some time coming out of Congress that would become law because the president would sign it because he was his team was part of certainly deliberating on that deal. If they were very serious about it, they would move that deal forward and help help us make it into law. And it would deal with issues that cities. Uh, like Springfield, Ohio, are dealing with right now. But doesn't the, I mean, the White House opposes any mass deportation of Haitian migrants from I'm, Springfield, I right? Mean, that's what I would uh, Is that the question? My question. The that, question. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously, obviously, yes. But also, if they really wanted to deal with, I mean, I think the, the, the real, I think, core of the question is, okay, there's legislation out there. There's a policy, there's a bipartisan legislation that would deal with issues uh, that they have concerns about at the border and actually deal with an immigration system. Obviously, we do not, we do not support mass deportation of a community that is not, uh, does, is not part of a country that they came from. That doesn't make any sense. That is not something that we would support. But there's a deal out there. There's a deal, a bipartisan deal. They keep getting in a way. They're voting against their own deal. That doesn't make any sense. Where's, sense. where's the sense in that? Where's the sense in that? Okay. The president spoke about uh, the issue affecting Springfield uh, today. Why today? And, and he did reference the former president directly. Is his message intended for Donald Trump? I think the, what the president said speaks for itself. I think he was very clear. He saw it as an opportunity. Uh, he had. 1,200 people 
accelerating black excellence, uh, and he saw it as an opportunity. The, uh, we keep hearing from the Republicans who keep lifting this up, even though it's been debunked, this hateful smear. It's been debunked uh, by the Springfield mayor. It's been debunked by the city manager. It's been debunked by the Ohio Department Police Department. And we hear Republicans, national Republicans, uh, continue to spread that hateful conspiracy theory. And so the president took an opportunity to address it head on. I think his words and what he said very powerfully really landed very well and people got the message. And in the meeting with the prime minister today, do you, how much do you think there, what will the approach be concerning uh, threats that Putin has made about expanding um, his concerns to the West if mm -hmm. weapons are um, made available for Ukraine to go deeper into Russia. Yeah, his comments about NATO uh, uh, and the U.S. more specifically, look, that kind of rhetoric certainly is dangerous, uh, and, uh, but it's not new. It's not new for Russia. Uh, matter of fact, it has been the mainstay uh, of Russian propaganda throughout this war that they've had. This is their war that they've had. Uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is their aggression. This is what they have done. This is what Mr. Putin has done, to be more specific. Uh, and, it, uh, and that's how it started. And this war can end. This war, the war that we're seeing in, U in Ukraine, the aggression from Russia can, can, earn, can end today. Can end today. Russia can move their troops out of Ukraine, and it can end. So that type, again, that type of rhetoric is incredibly dangerous, uh, but it's not new. Certainly not new. Any announcement about uh, the president's support for munitions being used inside Russia? I wouldn't expect uh, any big announcement uh, uh, today. Look, the president certainly is looking forward uh, to meeting with uh, the prime minister. Uh, it is, he believes, it's an important uh, conversation that they're uh, going to have, and a varied conversation, a wide range of conversations about Indo-Pacific, Ukraine, obviously, the Middle East. Uh, and so I would uh, just leave it for there. There, and our policy certainly hasn't changed. Thank you, Ukraine. What is the holdup on a decision allowing Ukraine to use long-range missiles inside Russia? Uh, I'm not going to go. I, I got this question yesterday. I'm not going to deliberate here. I'm not going to get into specifics from here. Uh, I, as I said to Kelly O, I would not expect there to be any announcements uh, on this uh, coming out of this meeting. Uh, that's not something uh, that I would expect. Uh, there's been no policy change. But I, what I can continue uh, to make sure that you all know and you see it for yourself uh, is that the president is committed uh, to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs uh, to defend itself against Russia's aggression, to defend, to defend and fight for uh, their democracy. I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to deliberate. One from of here. the bigger criticisms of this administration has been that on everything that's ultimately given to Ukraine, the answer was first a no on attackums, on HIMARS, on Patriots, on fighter jets, and that if this had just been given to them on day one, maybe there wouldn't be the funding fatigue that Congress now has to grapple with the next time they need help, um, and that the aid that you guys promote has been slow walked in the form of a decision to use it. Let me just let's step back for a second. This president, what this president has been able to do in the past two years, really in his old his entire administration, is fix the reputation of this country that was that was tainted by the last president. We have to remember how we started, where we started, and what this president has been able to do. People thought NATO was going to be weaker. The president made NATO stronger. We got two more, two more countries that are now members of NATO. That's because of this president's, this president's leadership. We have 50 plus countries who are now backing Ukraine and continue to do so because of this president's leadership. Ukraine is fighting for their sovereignty. They're fighting uh, for their freedom and against Mr. Putin, who decided that he wanted to invade. The president has been very clear how important it is, how important it is, is to stand with Ukraine and in this time. We're talking about democracy. We're talking about freedom. And if anything, this president's actions and what he's been able to do has shown just that. Because it's not just about uh, you know, Ukraine and NATO and Europe. It's also about our national security as well. It's all connected. 
And the president's always going to do what is important for the, for the American people. And I think that is what you've seen, and that is what the president's going to focus on and continue to do. I was sitting here, you know, a couple of years ago, splitting hairs with Jen Psaki over whether drones are offensive or defensive weapons. I mean, this has been a struggle of this administration that has been a topic of criticism. Um, and now, you know, for instance, this week in the debate, the vice president was promoting what this administration has done in terms of giving Ukraine what it needs, but the, there's plenty of criticism outside of that to say that it's also effectively blocking a victory by slow walking these decisions. I think if you were to ask those 50 nations, if you were to ask NATO leaders, if you were to ask President Zelensky itself, uh, himself, um, uh, their thoughts on the president leadership, uh, I don't think they would have the words that you just said to me. I think they would say that the president has been a leader during this time and has had their backs. And I think that's what the president has shown. As it relates to what Ukraine needs to continue to defend themselves, we are in regular touch. My colleagues here at NSC, at State, at Department of Defense are in regular touch uh, with Ukrainians on their needs and what they, what they need to continue to fight against this aggression. So I'll leave it there. Go ahead. Just circle back to the U.S. deal thing that uh, Nadita raised. Um, putting aside the timing piece of it, yeah. a lot of the question right now is essentially whether the president is reconsidering <coughs> his position or not, right? Separate from the timing, what his decision will yeah. be. He said in the past that U.S. deal should be U.S. run and U.S. Yeah, and I said it at the top right. earlier, moments right. ago. And quote guaranteed. So I guess my, the core question is, he said he has their backs. He said that on, on Labor Day. But is he still planning on killing uh, the steel? We have to see the recommendation from CFIUS. Uh, that is the process. The president is waiting to see what CFIUS recommends. That hasn't happened. There's a process. They're going through their process. I know that it has been some time, but they're independent. They're going to go as slow as as fast as they choose. Uh, and so we're going to let that process happen. We are. The president's not going to say any more than what he has said until uh, CFIUS transmits uh, their uh, recommendation, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and so I'm not going to get ahead of that. A and what I will say, and this is, I know you didn't ask me about the timeline, but we put a statement last week saying that it, happened, it hasn't happened yet, so therefore it cannot be imminent. Well, we've reported that the existing CFIUS timeline is mm -hmm. September 23rd, so I, that's I, not too far away from now. And I, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to get into it from here about a timeline, a deadline. We're, I'm just saying to you, we have not received uh, their recommendation. And so, the, yeah. Joe Biden's previous statements on this, U.S. Steel remaining domestically owned and run guaranteed, yep. still stand. Still stand. I, I literally mentioned it in a, a, a question that I received from one of your colleagues, and I said his position continues. It is vital. It is vital for U.S. Steel to remain American steel company that is domestically and uh, and certainly uh, owned and operated. That stands. He said that on Labor Day, which is not too long ago, uh, when he was in Pennsylvania. He said to the steel workers, he has that their back, and that stands. Uh, as far as uh, as far as uh, uh, CFIUS, they, are, they haven't made their recommendation. It has not transmitted over yet. So the president, I can't say anything until that happens. Very quickly, with respect to the meeting this afternoon, or we've reported that the Europe or European countries believe that Iran has begun providing ballistic missiles to Russia to be used in attacks on Ukraine. Can you speak to whether the U.S. also believes that those shipments have begun, or is it unclear? So I would um, refer to the NSC. I believe they did a, a gaggle earlier today, so I refer you to their, those comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to go back to the long-range missile. Sure. Just, just one more. It's just that, uh, I mean, considering the tone of uh, the Russian president, the fact that you would take this as a direct participation of NATO members. Um, and considering Article 5 of NATO Charter, how, what type of, of conversation has the President had with his yeah. colleagues, Canadian Prime Minister, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. one of them, yeah. uh, just to, uh, to have everybody ready for a potential 
uh, attack on the NATO country? Look, I'm, I'm not going to get in, uh, ahead of any conversations. What I can say are certainly our policy has not changed. Uh, I don't want to speak to hypotheticals here. I just am not going to go into what if this happens, then what. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. What I can say, this is incredibly dangerous type of rhetoric that we're hearing uh, from uh, from Russia. Not unusual. This is the. This is the type of propaganda that we've heard from Russia throughout uh, this war. Uh, but uh, and, and when asked, we're going to be very clear about that. Uh, and then when also asked, we're going to also be very clear that this war can end. Mr. Putin can end his aggression that we have seen in Ukraine. It is his war that he started. He can end it. Pull the troops out. Pull his troops out. He can end it. I don't have conversations with leaders, NATO leaders, I don't on have any, I don't, the gravity of, of the conflict. I, I don't have any new conversations to, to share. As I've said, this is not new for Russia. We have seen this throughout the war, making this type of dangerous uh, comments, dangerous rhetoric, not new. Uh, and there is a way to fix this. This is for Russia to end its war. A personal question, actually, Karim, because no. I was listening to you uh, this morning, well, at, at noon, and you refer to yourself as a proud Haitian American. Yeah. Um, that's not that's not new. That's not new. No. Uh, but do you do you take this personally when a com the community is a target of attack as it is at the moment in Springfield? Spring I I take it personally when any community, any vulnerable community, is attacked. Not just not just a community that I belong to, uh, and proudly belong to. But any community, any vulnerable community that is attacked, wrongfully so, in a hateful way, I, one of the things that I'm proud about in being part of this administration is that we condemn that type of stuff. We condemn that type of hateful language. That's what I'm, that's what I'm going to continue to do. And I get to do that on behalf of President Biden, who also condemns that type of hateful rhetoric, as you have heard him today and many times before when a vulnerable community is attacked. That's not what national leaders should be. Political leaders should not be attacking vulnerable communities. That's not who we should be. And if they're going to fall for conspiracy theories online, maybe they shouldn't be our leaders. Maybe they shouldn't be. Uh, but it is on all of us. It doesn't matter if you're Haitian American, if it doesn't matter if you're Jewish American, it doesn't matter if you're Muslim, it doesn't Muslim American, all of us should come together. When we hear that type of hateful rhetoric, we should come together and have each other's backs and call it out because it's not okay. It is dangerous. It is dangerous. It puts people's lives at risk. And this president is going to continue to stand up and speak against it. Go ahead, Patsy. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, one last question. It's, it's not funny. I, I know I'm you want to make. I, 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 wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. Hold on. It's not funny. I I, wait. No. It I is not. Wait. I, I'm answering. Let me answer. Are it, there stop. Any vulnerable communities? Not everybody wants to hear the sound of your voice, sir. Give me a second, and I will tell you my answer. It's not funny. Patsy. Thank you, Graham. Following up on one last ride on the long range yeah, uh, sure. weapons, can you just give us a sense of what might be the president's biggest concern at this point? Is it uh, the risk of escalation with the nuclear power? I'm, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals here. We're going to call it out. Uh, oh, you mean like with, with, with Russia? with Russia making the comments about NATO and U.S.? We've been trying to get you to give us more details on what's a hold up on providing oh, more I see. missiles to Ukraine. I, I, I don't have anything else to share. Our policy has not changed. We are going to be in regular touch uh, with the Ukrainian uh, 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 people uh, as they continue to fight this a fight against this aggression from Russia. No change in policy. I just don't have anything to add. The president has been a leader when it comes to giving Ukraine the support that they need. 50 plus countries, uh, that is important uh, to note. Making NATO stronger, that is important to note. And that is because of this president's uh, leadership. I just don't have anything else to share behind that. Can we stay on Russia? Uh, sure. The, the State Department just announced new sanctions on Russian state media RT 
uh, laying out its disinformation campaign operations to destabilize various governments, including the government in Argentina, creating tensions between neighboring countries. Does the administration have a specific strategy to try to stop RT's efforts? in the Western Hemisphere or other places in the world? So I'm going to let uh, certainly the State Department and uh, the Department of Justice uh, speak to uh, their announcement. You heard from the State Department today. You heard from the Department of Justice last week. Uh, we are taking this very seriously. Uh, they are taking it very seriously. Uh, I'm not going to get into what's next. Uh, certainly they will make uh, announcements uh, on their own if they feel that there's more to share. Just uh, indulge with a response that uh, RT has given out on social media, saying RT lives rent free in the State Department's head. We're running out of popcorn, but we'll be here live laughing hard. I mean, kind of mocking the administration's uh, steps on sanctioning them at this point. Do you have a response? So, um, so let's not forget last week uh, the Department of Justice, and I just mentioned the, tre the Treasury. Uh, Treasury uh, and state, they took some actions to disrupt uh, uh, Russia's covert information operations to undermine our democratic institution in the homeland. We do not laugh at that. That is very serious, and we take that very seriously. Uh, and state's announcement today make it clear that the U.S., and I want to be clear, is not only targeting RT's covert operations. Uh, we learned that, in fact, in fact, RT uh, covert influence efforts extended to places like Europe and Africa. That's what we learned. Uh, anything more than that, I would have to refer you to the State Department and the Treasury uh, to speak to that uh, as they made that announcement t today. Uh, just don't have anything else. But we take this very seriously. Okay. Hi. Uh, Trinity, I was, I, told, I was told you were going to be in the briefing room today. Howard University? Yes. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Want to say a little bit about yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Trinity Webster Bass. I'm a senior honors broadcast journalism major, Afro American Studies minor, attending Howard University. And I had the pleasure of meeting Kareen at the White House Correspondents Association dinner, in which I won a scholarship. Congratulations um, again. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to the event held today on the South Lawn. Why was it important for the Biden administration to hold this event today? And are a future events coming of the same nature? So look, um, I, I want to start off by uh, uh, quoting what the president said, and I think it's important uh, today when he was addressing the crowd uh, on the South Lawn. We recognize that this nation would not exist without the blood, sweat, and tears, without the determination, dreams, and contributions of black Americans. And he felt that it was fitting to do this on the same week of the Congressional Black Caucus Week. It was a really special event. I think you felt that out there if you were participated. Um, and so he wanted to host this brunch for a couple of reasons, uh, to show his personal gratitude uh, to the community and celebrate their progress. Uh, the progress we've made under the Biden-Harris administration. You heard him talk about that in his remarks and, uh, and wanted to make sure that we didn't forget, that we continue to speak to uh, why Afri uh, uh, black Americans and uh, African-American history is really part of American history. And that is something that uh, we cannot forget. I'm going to take one last one. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Big political news earlier this week when Taylor Swift endorsed the <laughs> vice president. I'm not going to ask you about the endorsement because you're not going to answer that. But uh, the voting registration site that she drove people to from her post, in that first 24 hours, there were more than 400,000 visitors from that link. Yeah. Is the president aware of that traffic and, and the interest in the registration? And does he think that that kind of influence can make a difference in driving turnout, getting people to get more engaged in elections. I think it's important for people to exercise their sacred right to vote. And that is something that the, pers the president finds it incredibly important to continue to do and to protect that right to vote. Uh, I, I do want to say, as it relates to uh, Taylor Swift, what I can say is there are a lot of Swifties here in the White House. Uh, and so I can say that. I hear that a lot. <laughs> um, but um, look, 
One of the things that he did is very early on in his administration, he signed an executive order uh, to do everything that we can from the federal level uh, to make it easier for Americans uh, to vote. And so that is what you saw. I, the link that you mentioned, obviously, um, uh, is, is a way to make it easier uh, for uh, Americans to register, certainly, uh, to vote. It is a sacred right. Uh, many people have fought for that right uh, to vote, uh, and it is certainly uh, our, part of our democracy, uh, and so it's incredibly important. I've not spoken to the president beyond, uh, beyond um, uh, an in the endorsement that occurred. Uh, I have not asked him about uh, specific about the, the link and, and um, uh, the amount of people have, who have gone on it to, uh, uh, to register. I think that's great. It's important uh, outside of this election. I think it's important for people to be able to register and vote. That's why this administration has done everything that we can uh, to give people that opportunity and protect that right. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.